Oh hey, I finally got to start to make a living by talking about the hardest games of all time. All I gotta do is just do a quick Google, and here we go. Well, I already talked about the Cuphead, so let's take a look at the others here. Well, most of these games I could afford or, I don't know, I don't have the appropriate systems to play them on. Um, Ninja Gaiden 2. I don't have Ninja Gaiden 2, but what I do happen to own is Ninja Gaiden on the Virtual Console. Well, it's close I could get to playing the original on an official Nintendo console, so might as well try it out. But first, let's take a little history lesson. Ninja Gaiden is a hack and slash side scroller platform video game developed and published by Tecmo. Tecmo first announced the Famicom version of the game in the January 15, 1988 issue of Family Computer Magazine under the title Ninja Gaiden, which would later be used for the game's American version. I found this on Chris Covell's website, and I recommend going to his website. You can find a ton of info about NES and Famicom games in their early stages that were only exclusive in Famimagas, or Family Computer Magazines. It was developed and released around the same time as its arcade version of the same name, but neither were direct ports of each other. According to developer Masato Kato, who is known for penning the script of Chrono Trigger, as well as other RPG titles like Xeno Gears, Chrono Cross, and Final Fantasy VII and XI, the term ninja was gaining popularity in North America, so Tecmo decided to develop a ninja-related game for the NES at the same time the arcade version was being developed. This was Masato Kato's first full-time project as a video game designer. The game was released in Japan on December 9, 1988, with North America on March 13, 1989, and the PAL version on August 15, 1991. Alright, let's finally play a game. Well, as you can see, I'm playing this game on 3DS, which is played through the Virtual Console, which has save states. I lost all variability. Whatever, it's time for it. Let me tell you, this looks amazing for a game in the late 80s. The amazing graphics and soundtrack. It is also one of the few NES games to have fully animated cutscenes. While they're not a common these days, these are pretty fun to watch. Let's talk about the gameplay. We play as a ninja named Ryu Hayabusa. You mean Ryu from Street Fighter? His father's name is Ken. Okay, Ryu and Ken. How can you not think of Street Fighter when you hear those names? Where were we? Now, as you may notice, this game is incredibly different from its arcade counterpart. The arcade version is more so another double dragon, whereas here you have a more traditional side scroll. You attack using a katana, you can also attack while jumping or in midair as well. You can use your secondary weapons like shurikens, fireballs, and boomerangs by holding up on the d-pad and pressing the b-button. Though every time you use them, they'll drain your spiritual strength. You can regain your spiritual strength by collecting red and blue spiritual strength items found in lamps and lanterns by attacking them. Much like in Castlevania, where you destroy the said objects to obtain hearts and power-ups. You can jump on and off walls, but you can't attack in this state. You can jump off walls by holding the d-pad in the opposite direction you're facing and pressing the a-button. There are 6 acts in total that compromise 20 levels, each harder than the last. The story is as follows. Ryu's father, Ken, was killed in a duel. After the duel, Ryu receives a letter from Ken which tells him to find an archaeologist named Walter Smith in America. So Ryu goes to America to avenge his father and find Walter Smith. Before he can find Walter, he is shot and kidnapped by a young woman who later hands him a demonic looking statue before releasing. Ryu finds Walter who tells him about the demon statues he and Ken had found in the Amazon ruins. There are two demon statues, Light and Shadow. With the two statues combined, they can transform into Jashin or Jashin if you will, the evil demon that Shinobi defeated. So during their conversation, a masked figure steals the shadow figure. Ryu chases him down, retrieves the statue, returns, finds that Walter is dying, and the light statue is missing. 
Three men confront Ryu and take him to an interrogation group where he meets Foster, head of the Special Auxiliary Unit of the CIA. Foster explains to Ryu that someone under the name Jakyo? Hakyo? I'm calling him that guy. So Foster asks Ryu to go to the temple and eliminate him. Ryu finds bad guy holding captive the young woman from earlier. Ryu then drops from sight through a trapdoor and into a catacomb. Ryu encounters Bloody Malt. Ryu beats him and as he is dying, Malt reveals that he was the one who dueled with Ryu's father and that he is still alive. So he reaches the temple's inner chambers, he finds his father possessed by some evil figure. Ryu destroys it to save Scan. Bad guy tries to kill Ryu, but Ken throws himself to save Ryu. Ken is slowly dying. Ryu kills bad guy. A lunar eclipse occurs. Jashin returns. Ryu kills Jashin, but gets it pretty badly. Ken tells Ryu to leave him and take the woman instead. Foster orders the girl to kill Ryu, but she chooses not to. The two... Kiss. Happy ending. Alright, let's finally play the game. The enemies immediately respawn after you kill them when they're on the edge of the screen. The enemy placement is the worst. There's little to no space where you can land, attack, or be safe. There are bosses at the end of each act. The first few bosses are quite manageable. I use the term manageable because you are guaranteed to get hit multiple times. Yeah, you get hit by everything. Soldiers, Mike Tyson, birds, dogs, bats. There are three final bosses. The first boss is manageable once you get used to its attack path. The second boss, however, is a different story. The fire boss never miss. They'll follow you wherever you go. There's no escape. And also the second boss takes a while to die. While it may sound like it, there is still an attack pattern, so there's still a chance you can still progress, since the guy is playing on a virtual console. Next, you fight a giant xenomorph-looking shrimp. Its attack spread around the screen, and what's worse is that the final boss is easier than the second boss. Not to mention, the levels in this act are just... random. It has so many random enemy placements, you have little or no platform to stand on, you can fall off easily, and the amount of enemies attacking you? That's bullshit. Alright, that's one of the list. What else is there? Oh, that's one way to break a person. Oh hey, today we'll be taking a look at E3 this 2022. Now, before we begin, I just want to note that we'll only be taking a look at some of the more major E3 presentations, such as the Xbox and Bethesda Showcase, the Sony State of Play, all of those. Also, I'll be saying my opinions on these presentations, whether how some certain games look and how they were presented, whether they were good or bad, all of that possessed. So please don't take them all too seriously. Anyway, let's dive right in. First up is Sony's State of Play on June 2, starting things off with the announcement of the Resident Evil 4 Remake, which is set to launch on March 24, 2023. The original Resident Evil 4 is one of the highly anticipated, if not one of the best games of all time. Now, I'm not a huge Resident Evil fan, but I have a ton of respect for the series. While the trailer only showed cutscenes, we pretty much know how a remake of a Resident Evil game would look like. The original Resi 4 has this sort of brownish tone. While the game has its scary moments, the brownish color just doesn't age well. While here, it looks even more scary with a darker, scarier ambiance. Resident Evil Village and No Man's Sky are set to launch soon on the PSVR 2. From what I've heard, the original PSVR version for No Man's Sky wasn't great. So hopefully the PSVR 2 will justify the VR experience of No Man's Sky. Horizon Forbidden West is getting a major update and the gameplay showcase for the upcoming Horizon Call of the Mountain, also launching on the PSVR 2. Spider-Man Remastered is coming to PC. I can only imagine how many mods will be available for this game. There's so much room for creativity in a game like this. Given how well Death Stranding, God of War, and Horizon Zero Dawn were on PC, 
there's a good chance this game will be eye-catching. However, I wanted the original Spider-Man PS4 and PC. It's mainly because I prefer Peter Parker's face on the original compared to the remastered version, but I could go on for 20 minutes. Stray looks awesome. I love the dystopian atmosphere and all, and the environment feels massive since we're playing with the perspective of a cat. I'm more of a dog person, but I'm willing to give this game a try, if I have the budget. The Callisto Protocol. It looks fine, it's just another dead space. The only thing I remember here in this trailer is the health net. Roller Dome looks like a pretty wild third person shooter, I love it. Eternites is a mix between a dating and an action game. It looks great graphically, but I don't ever see myself playing this game. Street Fighter 6 got a new trailer, and wow. I love the stunning new visual design, and the adventure mode where you're exploring an open environment, definitely buying this game if I have the chance. PlayStation fans, if you don't have a Nintendo console but want to play Zelda game, here's Tunic. Honestly, a fantastic looking game. A great mix of Dark Souls and Zelda, but with a charming art style. Same goes for Season, the art style just looks charming and relaxing. And finally, we end things off with Final Fantasy 16. It looks awesome. Everything just feels so epic. And I really love the pacing in the trailer. I also like the UI shown in the gameplay. It doesn't look too cluttered up and looks pretty organized. So that's State of Play this 2022. Honestly, a pretty good showcase. They showed a handful of quality looking games, definitely must have tiles. I like that they're bringing some of their exclusive tiles to the PSVR too. Uh, VR games aren't given much attention compared to just standard tiles, so hopefully this will give VR more recognition. However, most of the games we've already heard of. The entire showcase was pretty much a remake of an old game, PS4 titles coming to PSVR 2 and PC, and the new games, besides Final Fantasy 16 and Street Fighter 6, didn't really click to me. Next is Summer Game Fest 2022, starting off with another trailer for Street Fighter 6, this time showing Gil. It's awesome to see him back. Uh, one complaint though, why does Gil look so young compared to the returning fighters? Next is Aliens Dark Descent. It looks okay, though the entire trailer was full of cutscenes, until a short amount of gameplay footage is shown at the very end of the trailer. Kalissa Protocol is shown again, and Jeff Keighley stop reminding me of Health Neck. Hi everyone, in 2019, modern warfare changed everything. Yeah, just like pouring water on a rock, it changed nothing. A gameplay footage of Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2. Not this Modern Warfare 2, this Modern Warfare 2. Confusing, isn't it? Flashback 2 was shown off. Uh, Witchfire, Fort Solis, oh, Jesus, man. This is the third space game shown off this E3. And they decided to talk about the game for over 4 minutes. Dwayne Johnson run to remind you of the upcoming Black Adam movie, and literally, this went on for too long. Outriders World Slayer, a montage of Nintendo games that we already heard of, Fall Guys announced that they're not dead and their game is now free to play, Stormgate, Highwater, American Arcadia, a new trailer for Dead Island 2, Goat Simulator 3, Goat Simulator 2, this was a pretty bizarre trailer. At first I thought it was just a mock-up of the Dead Island 2 trailer, until the Agricultural Revolution returned. Marvel Midnight Suns, a gameplay trailer for Cophead's upcoming DLC, really looking forward to it. Neon Lights looks pretty rad, it's like if you take Persona and turn it into a first-person shooter, it looks great. Midnight Fight Express, Warframe gets another update, Honkai Star Rail, New look at Honkai Star Rail, an upcoming open world space RPG. Yeah, a lot of space today. <laughs> you got that right. Zenless Zone Zero, TMNT Shredder's Revenge looks awesome. And the fact that you can play up to six players locally is insane. It reminds me a lot of Turtles in Time on the SNES. Definitely a must have title to play with friends and family. Super People, Humankind, Cultures of Latin America, One Piece Odyssey, Soul Hackers 2. Capcom Arcade Stadium 2, I hope that they no longer have to make you pay arcade titles separately.
because that was annoying in the first arcade stadium. You would have to buy arcade tiles separately. That would make more sense if it were in mobile devices. Mario Strikers Battle League finally released, haven't played it yet because I am poor. Metal Hellslinger looks promising. The Quarry and Dining Gale, a demo for Saints Row Boss Factory. Warhammer, Layers of Fears looks awesome. Gotham Knights. And finally, the end things off with the announcement of The Last of Us Multiplayer, which appears to be its own standalone game, The Last of Us show on HBO, and The Last of Us Part 1 Remake. What? A remaster of The Last of Us exists, and it still looks excellent to this date. Why do we need a remake? Doesn't the game already look graphically fantastic? And what else is there to remake? It's nice that The Last of Us Part 1 is still getting support, but a remake is unnecessary because the original's gameplay still holds up today. I'm not pissed, just confused. Also, why didn't they just announce this in State of Play? That was Summer Game Fest. It was fine. The only stuff that I remember were Street Fighter 6, Health Neck, Modern Warfare 2, Cuphead's DLC, Shredder's Revenge, The Last of Us, and the sheer abundance of space games. And that was like a quarter of the games shown. Most of the games, especially the space ones, can just kind of blend in together. It just feels like they keep showing the same damn trailer all over again. Alright, got a little upset there. Hopefully Xbox has something good to show. They start the presentation with a gameplay chair for Redfall, following with Yes! We finally get a 1 minute of gameplay footage of Silk Song, the long awaited sequel to Hollow Knight. And it's going to be a day 1 Game Pass title, this is amazing! I love Hollow Knight, I spent a lot of time playing the game and looking at the trailer, the gameplay just looks so fluid. Originally, Silk Song was supposed to be just a DLC for Hollow Knight, and the fact that it is its own game now... Oh boy, I'm really looking forward to what it has in store for us. High in Life looks weird, but I kinda like it. Xbox Game Pass subscribers can unlock every character in all of Riot's games. League of Legends, Valorant, the rest. I'm not into all of these games, but I gotta admit, this is a huge thing for League and Valorant fans. A Plague Tale Requiem, Forza Motorsport is back baby and it looks awesome. Microsoft Flight Simulator is getting an expanded edition featuring helicopters and Halo. Overwatch 2 is coming out on October 4 in early access and free to play. Aura History Unfold, Elder Scrolls Online is getting another expansion, Forza Horizon 5 is getting a Hot Wheels expansion and it looks like a lot of fun. Arc 2 featuring Vin Diesel. And dinosaurs. No gameplay, just Vin Diesel and dinosaurs. A gameplay trailer for Scorn and it looks scary. Flintlock, The Siege of Dawn, Minecraft Legends. It looks a bit familiar with Minecraft Dungeons and that game released two years ago. Lightyear Frontier, Gunfire Reborn, The Last Case of Benedict Fox looks like a nice mix of a game like Inside and the Ori series and it looks fantastic. As Dusk Falls, Naraka Blade Point is coming to Xbox as a launch exclusive after being a huge hit on PC. Pentiment, Grounded, Araban, Shadow Legacy looks awesome. Diablo 4 gets a gameplay showcase. Sea of Thieves Season 7, Ravenlock, Cocoon, Wolong, Fallen Dynasty. Yes! Persona is finally coming to Xbox. They include Persona 3 Portable. Persona 4 Golden and Persona 5 Royal, they're the best versions of these 3 Persona games, and I'm down. I played Persona 3 Portable on the PSP and had a lot of fun memories playing the game. Playing the game on a modern console with a larger screen is a dream. Now, I'm excited to announce a special partnership between Xbox Game Studios and one of the greatest creative minds and innovators in our industry. Someone that I have admired for many years. Today, I'm pleased to share, we will be working together to create a brand new experience like we've never seen before. Thank you, Kojima-san. Hideo Kojima just appeared out of nowhere and announced that they're working on a new game. I'm, I mean, seriously, what's the point of this? And why are they showing this on a presentation? They didn't show anything. 
They could have just announced this on like Twitter or something, and the impact would remain the same. And finally, we end things off with Bethesda's Starfield. It's Fallout, but in space. It looks okay. The game looks a bit generic, yet expensive, or that's just what Todd Howard said. It just looks like another No Man's Sky but with upgraded graphics. We saw little in the gameplay and none of it really speaks out to me. It just feels so slow and sluggish. The character customization stuff? We've already seen those things in previous Bethesda titles. And that is Xbox and Bethesda Game Showcase. Majority of the games didn't really convince me. I'd say it's a bit lacking compared to Summer Games Fest in terms of the games shown. At least in Summer Games Fest, they showed new games that are at least worth a purchase. Here, while they did show new games, they were quite forgettable. It's not a bad presentation, they made some crazy announcements here and there. It's just that their offerings aren't the most memorable. Next is Capcom Showcase, starting off with a new trailer for Monster Hunter Rise Sunbreak, featuring a new locale, new monsters, and... Gormagala is back! My favorite monster in the Monster Hunter series. It's so cool to see him back. And it's also cool to see Espinos Return, a monster that originated from Monster Hunter Frontier, which is the first spin-off title in the Monster Hunter franchise. We also Tsujimoto reveals the first fleet tile update for Sunbreak featuring Lucent Targakuga returning from Monster Hunter 3 Ultimate. A demo for Sunbreak released after the presentation. Street Fighter 6 and Capcom Fine Collection were mentioned, but they didn't show anything new about these games. A little more info on Capcom Arcade's second stadium. In addition to a bundle that features all 32 titles, each title is available for individual purchase and features. Damn it! At least Street Fighter 2 The World Warrior is made available for free for a limited time, which I immediately downloaded on my PS4, but I'm still mad. Exo Primal is the upcoming dinosaur PvP shooter, and it looks like a lot of fun. They shot off a new gameplay trailer, and they also announced that there will be a closed network test on PC in July and you can sign up on the game's website. Capcom showed off a trailer for Dragon's Dogma's 10th anniversary. They also announced that there will be an upcoming presentation for the anniversary and we'll get to them in a few moments. A new DLC for Resident Evil Village featuring a new story mode, a mercenaries add-on, and third person mode for the main story. It's nice to be able to play the main story in third person, but I think a lot of the horror goes away in this perspective. I think a lot of the horror elements of the game lie in first person. Doesn't mean it's a bad thing, I just kind of think of it that way. The DLC will be releasing on October 28th alongside Resident Evil Reverse, which was supposed to launch with Village originally until it got delayed. They showed very little gameplay footage for the Resident Evil 4 remake, and then we end the presentation with Resident Evil 2, 3 Remake, and 7 getting upgrades for the PS5 and the Xbox Series X and S. The presentation wasn't bad, they did show some good stuff, but they mentioned games and they didn't show anything new about them. So what's the point of mentioning them when you have nothing to show? Pretty much all of their games we already know about and have been or will be released. They didn't show anything new besides DLC for Monster Hunter Rise and Resident Evil 8. Square Enix didn't have their own presentation this E3. What we do have is a Final Fantasy VII presentation in commemoration of the game's 25th anniversary. Starting with the Steam version of Final Fantasy VII Integrate which was released shortly after the presentation. A quick little montage of some merch. Season 3 of Final Fantasy VII The First Soldier, alright cool, moving on. A new gameplay trailer for Final Fantasy VII Ever Crisis, which contains the events throughout the entire Final Fantasy VII timeline. I hope this game will eventually make its way to home consoles, considering this is another remake of a home console game. There will also be a closed beta test for this game later this year. A remaster of Crisis Core? Yes! Five years ago. Where are you? What happened to you? I'm trying so hard to find you. Sorry. Feel like I failed you. It's been confirmed. Final Fantasy VII is getting its own trilogy, and they reveal Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. 
I might be getting a heart attack. The presentation was short, but they showed a ton of crazy announcements. It was great, that's pretty much all I can say. I'm happy that we're getting a Crisis Core Remaster and a Final Fantasy VII Remake trilogy. Again, there's not much I can say about the presentation. It was amazing. As mentioned earlier, Dragon's Dogma held their own presentation for the game's 10th anniversary. They start off with the development of Dragon's Dogma. This went on for more than 10 minutes, but hey, Dragon's Dogma 2 is finally announced. That was it. So that was E3 2022. It was disappointing. Majority of the games shown don't really leave an impression to me or probably to anyone who has watched any of the E3 presentations. Games like Starfield are all about being a massive world. When they were shown, they just feel boring. Sometimes it's obvious that they're struggling to keep up with the latest standards. And the other new games? They're fine, but they don't seem to be convincing enough to warrant a purchase. The overall presentations just lack the quality of their games. It becomes more and more questionable as to why games are like this now. It's all about quantity. But no matter how disappointing this year's E3 is, I'd still look forward to the next calamity. Oh hey, you ever hate cups? Me neither. Speaking of which, there is this one difficult game where everyone keeps talking about. And you're either gonna appreciate it or just freaking dread it. Cuphead was announced on October 26, 2013 and was released on September 29, 2017 worldwide on PC and Xbox One, October 19, 2018 on the Mac, April 18, 2019 on the Switch, and July 28, 2020 on the PS4. The game was made by Studio MDHR, an indie video game development studio run by Jarrett and Chad Moldenhoff. There are two types of levels of this game, one is the run and gun section and the other are the boss battles, both of which are pretty self-explanatory. And that's all about it, that's how simple the game gets. Moving on to the plot, Cuphead and his brother Mugman are idiots, they're so stupid they went to the casino and when their lives are at stake they lost, and now they beg for their lives and in return they have to cause chaos in a mushroom kingdom. Now the gameplay. In most 2D shooter games, let's say Mega Man for example, you shoot using a blaster. In this game, you shoot with your fingers. I love it. There are a handful of different weapons to choose from, and all of them are pretty fun to use. They all have their advantages and disadvantages. I mainly use the spread attack as I can have a wide range of attacks. You also have a super attack which you can use by filling up the card meter on the bottom left. Like the main weapons, there are different special attacks. There is also the parry mechanic which allows you to parry pink objects. This is a risky trick to pull out as most of the pink objects throughout the entire game are enemies and projectiles. If you successfully parry an enemy or an attack, you get an additional card on your meter which really helps a lot. Let's talk about how the game looks. First off, the game looks stunning. No other game has ever tried this kind of art style before. Everything feels so lively, and sure, there are probably older games that have replicated this art style before, and there are most likely to be indie games that I've never heard of before, but this is the more major one to have topped it off. The animations in the game feel so fluid, and it really works well with how you move around. There are so many small details in both the foreground and the background. And not only does this game have the rubber hose animation, but they also accompanied it with a jazzy and catchy soundtrack. Wow, it really feels like I'm interacting with an old cartoon. Good day for a well battle. I have to start the whole thing all over again? There are no checkpoints in any level, and every time you die, the game shows your progress through that level, which I guess can motivate you sometimes, but it is just painfully dreadful to see this. And not only that, but they also show a message of the enemy mocking the player. Up first we have the running gun stages. There are two in each area of the game. 
In every run and gun stage, there are coins which you can use to unlock new abilities and weapons. The best part is that these stages aren't really required, that way you can just blast through the entire game just by fighting the bosses. But as someone who's a little bit of a completionist, I never skipped any of them. They're fun yet difficult challenges, though they're painstakingly long. Now let's talk about the main takeaway of the game. The bosses. They are Dark Souls bosses nerfed and disguised into cartoon characters. First up we have the slime from Dragon Quest. It's not a pretty difficult boss fight. It's really big and it moves really slow which gives you time to attack. As the first boss of the game, I think this guy needs some appreciation. Next up we have Decepticon Belly Boop. This is the first boss fight where you get to fight on a plane. There is this tutorial for it before you fight the boss. It's simple, like the opening tutorial as long as you're not a game journalist. This boss fight can be a bit challenging, but it takes at least a few tries, which happened to me. The next boss is a farm. You have to defeat 3 bosses. There are actually a total of 4 bosses here, and you can unlock the secret boss by not attacking the giant onion. It's a pretty easy fight, moving on. Next are boxing frogs. The first two phases are manageable, pretty much every incoming attack is easy to dodge. But when we get to the final phase, the two frogs turn into one and become a lottery machine. You have to parry the crank in order to damage them. Once you do, there are three faces that will appear on the white circles. Each one will summon their own drums. The snake drums have small drums which require you to drum continuously. The tiger drums have orange balls that float up and down with each platform. This is the stress inducing one. Lastly, we have the bull drums, which have red platforms in the middle of the screen that will shoot fire above or below you. This was the first boss that I struggled with. It's difficult. Finally, we have the sunflower. This is a pretty tough boss fight, just because there's so much stuff going on in the first place. The last phase can be a bit tough, but there isn't much stuff going on compared to the first phase. Moving on to the second area, Inkwell Isle 2, we have DJ Imi the Great. I wish today's DJs have this kind of name. This fight is the hardest yet. It really puts your piloting skills to the test. Because you're fighting on a plane, you have more wiggle room to move around. And because of that, the DJ uses attacks that spread around the entire screen. So you need to shrink in order to avoid the attacks. Who knew being a nation is this helpful against a DJ? Anyway, this guy has a ton of faces. In fact, he has the most faces out of all the bosses in the entire game. There is also a sort of secret face you can unlock by turning into a tiny plane while the DJ is scanning you. This will skip the fourth phase but will make the final phase more difficult. This entire fight takes a ton of tries to beat, but it's far from impossible. Next is the average parent in Candy Crush. You have to beat a series of 3 randomized bosses before entering the final phase. In the last phase, she throws her head and it chases you wherever you go in addition to the giant candy rolling in the ground. The fight's not too hard, you just have to get lucky to get the easiest 3 bosses in the beginning and not get hit. Moving on, we have Balloon Clown. This is a pretty tough boss fight just because there isn't much room to move around. It's hard to keep on track of things because there's just so many stuff going on. But like I said earlier, nothing is impossible in this game. Next we have Chicken Run. This fight takes a few tries to beat, you just have to constantly move around in order to not get hit. Like the part where the bird goes crazy and shoots a ton of feathers. It's not the hardest boss fight. Moving on. For the final boss in the second area, we have King Ghidorah. This is the hardest one yet. You have to jump and move around the floating clouds while also avoiding his tail and the flaming meatballs. In the second phase, there are a bunch of little flaming dudes that jump and try to kill you. You can't tell where they're going to jump, so the only thing you can do is duck. Finally, in the last phase, flaming orbs will be shot at you. Be careful not to hit them as they become hard to dodge. They also have this flamethrower move that will fire in the middle, so try to get to the top so you have more wiggle room to move around. And that's pretty much it, this is by far the hardest boss fight yet. Let's move over to Inkwell Isle 3, we have B-Movie, except it doesn't make me question my existence. Just like the previous boss fight, you have to jump and move around the moving platforms. 
The first phase is nothing all too crazy, but when we get to the second phase, things start to heat up. The Queen Bee uses a variety of attacks, like a spear that will follow you around, a triangle that also follows you but shoots projectiles out of its corners, and missiles. In the last phase, she turns into a giant plane and is on the bottom of the screen. You'd want to use the lobber or the chaser weapon for this phase. I like this boss fight just because there's realism. Next we have American Captain Hook and the Living Ship. This is sort of a hard boss fight. You just have to keep track of incoming attacks which can be a bit hard especially in the last two phases. Overall, not the hardest but still a challenging fight. Up next we have Dr. Robotnik and the Iron Giant. This is the same as the DJ fight but much more difficult. There are so many things going on and you're most likely to get hit every time. In the first phase you can only hit the head, chest, and the abdomen. Certain attacks come from each of these parts. By destroying them, the Iron Giant will gain new attacks. The second phase is nothing special. Every now and then the giant robot's head continuously charges back and forth from off screen to damage the player. Then we get to the final phase. Eggman pulls out his speed. Dr. Robotnik pulls out either a blue or red gem from the robot's mouth. Both of these gems do spread attacks, much like the chicken boss from earlier. Not only do you have to dodge the attack, but you also have to avoid the electrified walls that will appear. I could say this is the hardest one yet, but I spent more time trying to beat the dragon, so that fight is still the hardest one. What about some easier boss fights at least? Next is Sally's stage play. I'd say the second phase was the hardest. You have to avoid a ton of attacks while also paying attention to the background. There's this baby who throws bottles at you, so keep that in mind. Also in the last phase, you have to pay attention to the audience. They'll throw flowers at you that damage you for some reason. I like this kind of attention to detail in both the foreground and the background. That's what makes this game unique. Next we have German Rat. Just like the previous boss fight, most of the phases are easy, except the second phase. There isn't much room to move around here and you have to jump up and down to avoid the flamethrower attack. You also have to avoid the ball caps shaped like saw blades. Sometimes the ball caps extend individually, other times every ball cap on one side will extend so you have to keep moving to the other side. Overall, not the easiest but it's a quick fight. Next is Ariel. The first phase is not all too hard but it's not much easy as well. There are attacks that take most of the screen and you have to shrink in order to get some room. In the next phase, she can freeze you and you have to mash out of it. This gets more irritating in the last phase where she will freeze you and you'll get hit by the floating spikes. But other than that, it's passable. Finally, the last boss in the third area, we have Spooky Scary Skeletons and Shivers Down Your Spine. This is a very challenging one. You have a platform that can follow the train in three different places, and will only move if the vaults on either end are parried. You have to keep an eye out for the floating pumpkins as they will drop pink objects that can also parry the vaults, causing the platform to move. They're pretty much the worst thing to exist in the first half of the fight, so it's best to take them out before they drop the pink object. In the first phase, you have to shoot and avoid the bouncing eyeballs headed towards you. Moving to the next phase, the conductor pops out and attacks by slamming his hands onto two spots. You have to move the platform beneath his head where you can damage him while also avoiding the flying pumpkins. Onto the third phase, the flying pumpkins will disappear and two heads will pop out and their only attack is raining down lightning that moves closer to each side. This attack is slow so you may have enough time to move around. You also have to avoid the ghosts that are chasing you. If you kill them, a pink skull will come out and will carry the vaults if ever made in contact so be aware of that. In the last phase, in order to damage it, you must first parry the tail. Afterwards, the heart will become exposed which you can shoot and fire will come down after you. The grate will slam shut after a few moments so you have to continuously parry the tail. This is the hardest one by far just because of how many things are going on the screen and how long this fight takes. Moving on to the last area of the game, we're introduced to King Dice. This boss fight is the most unique and probably the most interesting of the bunch. In order to fight King Dice, you must play and finish the board by pairing the die. Whichever number you pick, you land on. The board compromises of save, start over, and fin spaces. And most importantly, 
the minibuses. The spaces numbered 1 through 9 are the spaces which contain minibuses. Some spaces have randomly generated hearts which give you an extra life. Every minibus is somewhat easy, but you have got to make sure you have enough hearts once the actual battle commences. King Dice only has one attack where he will send a row of cards. Some of the cards are pink so they can be parried. The problem here is that you'll lose a ton of hearts if you're not careful. Thankfully, after he finishes his attack, you can deal damage as he charges for the next attack. This is the longest boss fight I have fought, and probably the hardest one yet. Finally, we move on to the devil. This is the most tense fight yet, but it isn't the most challenging in my opinion. The devil attacks using either his pitchfork or just by transforming, both of which have three different variations. There are also minions that will come from either side, but they are easily killed. After getting enough damage, the devil will pull out his skeleton and escape through a hole leading to the next area. In the second phase, the devil grows into a giant, making it an easy target to hit. There are five floating platforms that you can stand on. You have to avoid the axe that moves in a spiral motion and the flaming poker chips that will fall down on either platform. There is also the bat bomb that can be parried. If you fail to parry it, the bomb will make a massive explosion, so keep that in mind. In the next phase, the devil gets angry and the floating platforms will be reduced to 3, making it easier for you to get hit by incoming attacks. He will summon two of his minions from both sides to shoot skulls at you, which can be parried. Above you, there is a group of small blue-winged demons that hone in on you. Then we get to the final phase where the devil is now crying. There is now only one platform in the center. You have to dodge the fallen poker chips while avoiding the devil's tears, which can be parried. After enough damage, you have defeated the devil and finished the game. Cuphead and Mugman ran back to town and freed all the debtors and were honored for their heroic actions. The end. That's pretty much it about the game. Overall, I love every single boss in the game. All of them are unique in their own ways. I have yet to find a single boss that is similar to another boss. And yeah, there are some bosses that have similar attack patterns, but each boss is accompanied with a specific theme that makes them indistinguishable from the other. The run and gun sections are a nice change of pace compared to the boss fights. Everywhere you go, you can't escape the masterpiece that is the game's soundtrack. Not only that, but the overall ambiance and the hand-drawn animation as well. What makes me appreciate this game even more is the fact that it is using the Unity engine. The Unity engine is an amazing tool for developers. We got fantastic games like Hearthstone, Hollow Knight, the Ori series, and many more because of this engine. But because it's widely and easily accessible, it has been accessible for many simple and terrible games. But it's really amazing that Cuphead was made using this engine, so this reason alone gives the Unity engine a mad amount of respect. Cuphead is an amazing game, no doubt. If there's one thing everybody can agree on about this game, it is that it has an amazing art style with a wonderful soundtrack. This game isn't for everybody, mainly due to its difficulty. but. I think this is the kind of game everybody needs to play at least once in their life. But I'm glad that's over. Oh hey, I was thinking of taking a break from playing challenging games, which is why I decided to play Bruce Lee Quest of the Dragon. It is the sixth generation of gaming. We begin with Sega getting an early lead with the release of the Dreamcast but later on it didn't do well enough to beat its other competitors. The PlayStation 2 outperformed its other competitors in this generation and soon became the best-selling console of all time. Nintendo released the Nintendo GameCube, and while the GameCube did better than the Dreamcast, it didn't do well enough to outshine the PS2. But there was one other company that stepped in the video game ring, one that changed the industry Forever. Microsoft. Huh. To this day, Microsoft is well known for its operating system, Windows. On October 25th, 2001, Microsoft released Windows XP and it gave huge success. 
but that was also during the reign of the PS2. Microsoft considered the PS2 a threat to the personal computer in the living room space. Consoles in this generation are getting closer to being as powerful as a PC, so Microsoft had to compete somehow against the PS2. The company decided to make their own video game console instead, and later that year, the Xbox was finally released. But you see, in order to compete against the PlayStation 2, you also need a great library of exclusive games, and not just a powerful console. You also need Shrek. The Xbox was released with 20 launch titles in North America, 12 launch titles in Japan, and 19 in Europe. One of which is the saving grace of the Xbox brand, Halo. Halo Combat Evolved was developed by Bungie. Before Microsoft acquired Bungie, the company concentrated on making video games for the Macintosh during its early days. Concerns were made during the development of Halo, one of which was being able to play a first-person shooter with a controller. Playing first-person shooters with a controller was nothing new at the time, but it happens very rarely. Sure, we got Doom and Wolfenstein, but those games were tailor-made for the PC in mind. So with Halo being a first-person shooter and only playable with a controller at the time, this is new territory. In order to make it to the release, the team had to make cuts to the game's features. The open world plans were scrapped, they reused some of the campaign levels, there was an online multiplayer feature built in, but it was dropped and rebuilt from scratch because the Xbox Live wasn't a thing at the time. Through many efforts and low amounts of sleep, the game was able to release alongside the Xbox on November 15, 2001. While Halo was not an instant runaway success on release, the game sold alongside more than 50% of every Xbox console. Halo received universal acclaim and many great review scores. And even to this day, Halo is considered one of the greatest games of all time. So let's try this game out and see why is it so great. To start off, I'm not the biggest Halo fan. The first Halo game I played was Halo Reach, which is lore-wise the first Halo game, so I have some connection to the franchise. Anyway, let's play Halo Combat Evolved. We'll start with the campaign since that's the reason why I want to play and talk about this game. And since we'll be playing as Master Chief, I gotta get into character. So we begin with a little tutorial about the controls. I'm using Halo Custom Edition, which allows me to play using either a keyboard and mouse or a standard controller. Both of them have great controls, but I'm more of a controller guy. No! Tutorial man! Anyways, we gotta go to the bridge to meet Captain Keys. Yes, that's his name. Sleep well? I have no recollection whatsoever. So you did miss me. What did I just say? With all due respect, sir, this war has enough dead heroes. I appreciate your concern, Cortana, but it's not up to me. The protocol is clear. Destruction or capture of a shipboard AI is absolutely unacceptable, and that means you're leaving ship. Lock in a selection of emergency landing zones, upload them to my neural lace, and then sort yourself for a heart transfer. Aye, aye, sir. Which is where you come in, Chief. Get Cortana off this ship. Keep her safe from the enemy. If they capture her, they'll learn everything. Force deployment, weapons research, Earth. Huh? Yank me. Good luck, Master Chief. So now we have Cortana inside our suit and now we have to escape the ship. You barely get any additional ammo for your rifle and pistol throughout the whole game, so what you want to do is to pick up the enemy's weapons. Every weapon in the game is really good. I like the plasma rifle which you can get by being the armored guys. The standard grunt aliens are nothing special and they carry either the needler or the plasma pistol. The same goes for the aliens carrying shields. Sure you wouldn't rather take a seat? Lady, I've been sitting my butt in a pod for 20 days, I need a warm up. Alright, we've crash landed and I'm the only one that survived, great. If you're on a plane that's about to crash, stand up, you have a 100% survival rate if you do. 
Anyway, we gotta search for some survivors. On the way, we discover some alien hideouts and infrastructures. The best part of this mission is driving the Warthog. Compared to your normal racing games, every vehicle in the game accelerates by pushing the left thumbstick forward. To turn around, you move the camera with the right thumbstick. Also, you can get a marine with you for some vehicles. So we rescued a bunch of marines, and now we gotta rescue Captain Keys. On to the next mission, we now have to board the alien ship where Captain Keys is being held. Stealth is an option here, do not do it, it's not fun. So we board the alien ship and fight our way through. <sighs> Coming here was reckless, you two know better than this. Thanks. Marines! Lock and load your weapons, let's be ready to move. While the Covenant had us locked up in here, I overheard the guards talking about this ring world. They call it... Halo. One moment, sir. Accessing the Covenant battle net. According to the data in their networks, the ring has some kind of deep religious significance. If I'm analyzing this correctly, they believe that Halo is some kind of weapon. One with vast, unimaginable power. That's bad news. If Halo is a weapon, and the Covenant gain control of it, they'll use it against us and wipe out the entire human race. Chief, Cortana, I have a new mission for you. We need to beat the Covenant to Halo's control room. Marines, let's move! Yes, sir! Okay, sir! Chief, you have the point. Alright, now that we know Halo is a super weapon, we need to get out of this ship. So we escaped the ship and now we have a new mission. We gotta get to the silent cartographer, which is a map room for Halo. Somebody order a warthog! Hey, I didn't know you made house calls for him. You know our motto, we deliver! I'm here! The best part of this mission is driving through an entire island in a warthog. Well, not the entire island, cause there are areas that you can't access with a warthog. There are multiple ways to progress and clear areas, so that sounds like a lot of fun. There. That hollow panel should activate the map. Analyzing. Halo's control center is located there. That structure appears to be some sort of temple or shrine if I've interpreted this correctly. Interesting. A shrine is an unlikely place to put such a significant installation. Cortana to Captain Keys. The captain has dropped out of contact, Cortana. His ship may be out of range or having equipment problems. Alright, we have access to the map. Now we gotta get out of here, find the control room, and rescue Captain Keys again. He really put himself in a lot of trouble, huh? Twice? This mission has a lot of variety. You can use every weapon and vehicle in the game. You can even use a tank, I didn't find it. But this mission takes a while to finish. Areas are repeated throughout the mission and sometimes it's easy to get lost, so it can get very repetitive. That terminal, try there. You alright? Never been better. You can't imagine the wealth of information. The knowledge, so much, so fast. It's glorious. Number 15, Burger King foot lettuce. What are you talking about? Oh, I meant the limited edition Halo onion ring. This ring isn't a cudgel, you barbarian. It's something else. Something much more important. The Covenant were right. This ring, it's Forerunner. Give me a second to access. Yes, the Forerunner built this place, what they called a fortress world, in order to... Wait. No, that can't be. Oh, those Covenant fools, they must have known, there must have been signs. Are we talking about Halo or the Halo Onion Ring? The Covenant found something, buried in this ring, something horrible, and now they're afraid. What? Captain, we've got to stop the Captain! At least explain. This cash he's looking for, it's not really... We can't let him get inside. Lady, you're being scary right now. There's no time. Get out of here, find keys, stop him. Before it's too late! Alright. Why is everything so dark and scary all of a sudden? 
On the way to the facility, we encountered the Covenant running away from something. I wonder what it is. It's so quiet. What happened here? Stay back! Stay back! You're not turning me into one of those things! I'm not a I'll wizard, your Marine. Out. Get away from me! Ah! You're, no, you're wasting your ammo. Me like you all done. What was that? Right, well, let's get this door open. I'll try, sir, but it looks like these Covenant worked pretty hard to lock it down. Just do it, son. Yes, sir. Got a bad feeling about this. Boy, you always got a bad feeling about Captain something. Sarge, can you hear me? What's going on, soldier? He's got contact! Lots of them! But they're not coming in! They're, they're just staring through us! What the flow? No! Corporal! Do you copy? Over! Mendoza, get your ass back up to second squad's position and find out what the hell is going on. But I don't have time for your lip, soldier. I gave you an Sarge, order. Sarge, listen. What is that? Where's that coming from, Everywhere. Mendoza? I don't. There, Mira. Ah, ah, man, hold get still. Out. Hold get still. Let him have it. Ah. Sergeant, we're surrounded. God damn it, Jenkins! Fire your weapon! There are too many, Sergeant! Don't even think about it, Marine. Oh, this is loco! Get back here, Marine! That's an order! Jenkins! Ew, what is that? Nobody told me this was Australia. They have legs now? They have legs now. R2, we need to be going up, not down. They shoot now? They shoot now. This is a terrible joke. This is supposed to be Halo, not a horror game. Greetings, I am the monitor of Installation 04. I am 343 Guilty Spark. No, you're c 3 Someone has released the flood. My function is to prevent it from leaving this installation, but I require your assistance. Come, this way. Chief, I've lost your signal. Where'd you go? Chief! Chief! Alright, so we gotta follow C3PO to the index. This place is dark and easy to get lost. There are just so many enemies that it feels like they infinitely respawn. The shotgun is your ultimate ally here. Throughout the missions, C-3PO would send in a squad of sentinels. Please follow closely. This portal is the first of ten. Ten? 
This is just like the other mission but more irritating. The flood takes much more damage to kill and will obliterate you. Also this mission goes on and on. Areas are repeated over and over. Ah, it's over! Unfortunately, my usefulness to this particular endeavor has come to an end. Protocol does not allow units with my classification to perform a task as important as the reunification of the index with the core. That final step is reserved for you, Reclaimer. supposed to happen oh really that was sick i've spent the last 12 hours cooped up in here watching you toady about helping that thing get set to slit our throat that's true i died a hundred times trying to get the index a construct in the core that is absolutely unacceptable sod off what impertinence i shall purge you at once you sure that's a good idea how 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 dare you? I'll... Do what? I have the index. You can just float and sputter. Alright, that's enough. You gotta stop the flood, and the only way to do that is to activate the Halo Onion Ring. You have no idea how this ring works, do you? Why the Forerunners built it? Halo doesn't kill flood. It kills their food. Humans, Covenant, whatever. We're all equally edible. The only way to stop the Flood is to starve them to death. And that's exactly what Halo is designed to do. Wipe the galaxy clean of all sentient life. You don't believe me? Ask him. This is true? More or less. Technically, this installation's pulse has a maximum effective radius of 25,000 light years. But once the others follow suit, this galaxy will be quite devoid of life, or at least any life with sufficient biomass to sustain the flood. But you already knew that. I mean, how couldn't you? Left out that little detail, did he? We have followed outbreak containment procedure to the letter. You were with me each step of the way as we managed this crisis. Chief, I'm picking up movement. You are unwilling to help. I will simply find another. Still, I must have the index. Give your construct to me. Or I will be forced to take her from you. Number 15. Save his head. Dispose of the rest. Ah, oh, it's a covenant. Oh, I missed you guys. Alright, we gotta stop C-3PO and destroy Halo. First, we gotta destroy its pulse generators. This is also the mission where you can finally fly on the Banshee. This is really fun. Not fun. Alright, we gotta find the captain. He is inside the ship. That is a big nut. It's done. I have the code. We should go. We need to get back to the Pillar of Autumn. Let's go back to the shuttle bay and find a ride. home for a few days and look what happens. This won't take long. There. That should give us enough time to make it to a lifeboat and put some distance between ourselves and Halo before the detonation. Can't imagine how exciting this is to have a record of all of our lost time. Human history, is it? Fascinating. Oh, how I will enjoy every moment of its categorization! To think that you would destroy this installation as well as this record! I am shocked. Almost too shocked for words. At least I still have control over the comm channels. Where is he? I'm detecting taps throughout the ship. Sentinels, most likely. As for the monitor... He's in engineering. He must be trying to take the core offline. Even if I could get the countdown restarted... I don't know what to do. 
Why not manually blow the ship? Okay, I'm coming with you. We gotta destroy the ship's fusion reactors. The only way to do that is to throw a grenade at them. Be sure that the flaps are open so that they can be destroyed. The Flood and the Sentinels are trying to kill you in the process, so be careful. Alright, all of the fusion reactors are destroyed, now we gotta get out of here. It's Warthog time. She's gone. Calculating alternate escape route. Ship's inventory shows one longsword fighter is still docked in launch base. Finally, now I can rest and finish my onion rings. So that was the campaign. Overall thoughts? Really impressive for a game in 2001. The graphics may not be over the top, but they look great for a game in this generation. The reveal of the Flood is undeniably well thought out, starting out as these ominous beings being revealed as powerful monsters. Throughout the last few missions of the campaign, we're not only facing your standard Covenant grunts, but we're also facing these monstrosities. It really feels like we're stepping into an unknown alien world, and Halo nailed that completely. Now on the multiplayer side. There are only two ways to play with other people, split screen and system blink play. Split screen multiplayer is outstanding back then in this game, that it is on par with what GoldenEye 007 did back in the Nintendo 64 with 4 player split screen multiplayer. People would bring their Xbox and TV to their friends' houses and play Halo with them. This is where the term LAN parties was born. They had such an impact on the gaming community. Multiplayer is one of the core identities of the Halo franchise. There's just so much stuff to do here in multiplayer. There's just so much stuff to do. There's just so much stuff to customize. Yeah, you can customize your own game mode if you want to. There's a ton of fun content here in this game. Without Halo, the Xbox brand would have been left in the dust long ago. Halo does not only affect Xbox as a whole, but it popularized multiplayer gaming for first person shooters. So I had a lot of fun playing Halo. I was amazed by its beauty and charm and this is definitely one of those timeless masterpieces of a video game. And now we're back to reality. Oh hey, it's that time of the year again. 8pm. For this special occasion, I want to talk about 
one of my childhood treasures, most notably one of the most popular horror video game franchises of all time. Five Nights at Freddy's. That's such a long title for a video game. Five Nights at Freddy's or FNAF in short took the world by storm in the year 2014. 2014 was a great time for a 6 year old me, basically the pinnacle of my childhood. I had a lot of great memories during this time. Before the FNAF craze, I remember hopping on YouTube and watching gameplays of Happy Wheels, Slenderman, and Minecraft. Then this came and it changed everything. I also remember watching and listening to fan-made music videos, especially by the games and the living tombstone. Yep, here's the list of my favorite music genres. So much FNAF stuff happened here and there. The community is massive, and by that, take a look at this graph. Say what you will about the franchise, it has a lot of impact on the horror video game genre. So let's take a look at each entry of the franchise and try to criticize what made these games good and why some of them are my least favorite. We'll be taking a look at the mainline entries first, then the spin-offs. Now, before we begin, I want to say that I won't be delving into the entirety of the series lore. It's mainly because there are still a ton of mysteries left unsolved and the lore itself is complex, especially to newcomers. So we'll only be taking a look at how each game looks and how they play. First up on Five Nights at Freddy's, Five Nights at Freddy's. So here's the core gameplay, you are in an office and it is your job to make sure that the animatronics are in their area, oh no. You have to use the cameras to figure out their location. You can't move anywhere so in order to survive you can shut the doors on both sides of your office. Beware of the power as the more you use it the faster it depletes. Once it depletes, it's game over. Unless. You have to make it to 6am, once you do it's on to the next night. And you have to do this for a total of 5 nights. It gradually gets harder with each one. There are two other secret nights. Night 6 you can unlock by just beating the previous 5 nights and the custom night that you can unlock by beating night 6. The custom night allows you to customize the difficulty for each animatronic. For each animatronic, we have Freddy, Golden Freddy, Bonnie, Chica, and Foxy. Bonnie and Chica can be easily found while Freddy can only appear in very few areas. Foxy stays in one location and you have to keep an eye on him as he will charge to your left door. Once he is doing that, quickly shut the left door until he is gone. But what about jump scares? This game has one of the best jump scares in the series as they look really real. The ambiance and the audio cues are really well put out especially if you're playing the game with headphones on. This is also one of the hardest entries in the franchise for me. From my experience back when I was 6 years old, I was able to breeze through the first 3 nights in the one go. Night 4 was the worst one. Possibly even worse than the last night. Beating this game for the first time was so rewarding that I forgot there were two more nights that I had to finish and from that moment forward, I never played the game again for a few weeks. What I think made this game so great gameplay wise is the power supply mechanic. It's the only entry with this mechanic. Sure, FNAF 2 has that but I don't think it leaves much impact compared to the first game. With this mechanic, a lot more strategy is required to complete a single night. Playing with headphones on helps since you can hear audio cues that determine whether that specific animatronic is in that area. But wearing headphones on can also make the jump scares leave much more impact. So that's the first FNAF game, 9 out of 10. Great design, great gameplay, and great jump scares. Next is FNAF 2. This game has some new changes compared to the last. You can toggle your flashlight on your cameras and the vents. There are no more doors that you can shut so you're much more vulnerable. The only thing in your arsenal is the flashlight and the spare Freddy mask. This mask is used to fool any animatronic into believing that the player is an animatronic themselves. Speaking of animatronics, there are too damn many of them here. We got Toy Freddy, Bonnie and Chica, Withered Freddy, Bonnie, Chica, Foxy, Mangle, and the Puppet. Oh, you also can't forget Withered Golden Freddy and Balloon Boy. Jesus, that's 11 animatronics. The puppet is the most interesting of the bunch. We have this jukebox that we need to keep playing. If we don't, then game over. 
Then we have Balloon Boy who steals your torch's batteries and has this annoying laugh. And let me tell you, this game is tough. Since there is no animatronics you need to keep track of, in addition to the flashlight's batteries and the puppet's jukebox, this game is much more intense and fast paced. This game is Ultimate Custom Night before Ultimate Custom Light is released. Now looking at this game from the outside, it's much more lively and that perfectly sets with the sheer difficulty of this game. As for the jump scares, they look a bit cheap compared to the first game. They are scary, no doubt, but they just feel a bit cartoonish to me sometimes. Sometimes after you got jump scared, a little mini game pops out that has something to do with the story. After that, another jump scare. 6 out of 10. Looks okay. Incredibly difficult. Moving on. FNAF 3. So this is what Greenland looks like. Why is everything green? I know that we are in an abandoned pizzeria, but at least make things look a bit more dusty and abandoned, not a science lab. So here's the gameplay. When you look left, you can access the settings. Here you can repair the ventilation, the audio, all that stuff. On the right, you can access the cameras. You can toggle between the main cameras and the vent cameras. We only have one animatronic that we need to be aware of. Springtrap. For the other animatronics, we have Phantom Freddy, Watermelon, Poxy, Balloon Boy, Mangle, and the Puppet. The Phantoms don't do anything serious, but they can mess you up. They just jump scare you, peace out, and you have to repair the vents. The Phantoms appear in specific locations. Figure out where they are and you'll get immediately jump scared. Springtrap appears often either on the vents or in the pizzeria itself. You can use the audio button to bait Springtrap into that specific location. There is no power supply here, the ambience and the audio cues aren't really something to write home about. The jump scares have the right balance of scariness, especially for the phantoms, but Springtrap's jump scares, they're not great. He's not even trying to scare you, he's just like, how you doing? 6 out of 10, easy, doesn't look great, moving on. FNAF 4, this game is set in a bedroom, the one place we're all familiar with. We're playing as a little child and we're gonna defend ourselves against the nightmares. There are no ways to defend yourself. Just like the third game, you have infinite batteries for a flashlight. Elon Musk should make one of those. You can open and close the doors once you go near them. Here you can also toggle your flashlight if the animatronics are there or not. You also have the closet and you can pretty much do the same things you can do with the door. Then we have the bed and all we can do is just point our flashlight. In this game, you're gonna rely heavily on the audio. There are very few visual cues that determine the location of an animatronic. Speaking of which, we got Nightmare Freddy, Bonnie, Chica, Foxy, Fredbear, Mango, Balloon Boy, Plush Trap, Nightmare Yone, and Nightmare. There are also Halloween themed designs for some of them. Their jump scares are some of the best and probably the most scariest. They nailed the ambiance with this game. It really feels like we're living our childhood nightmares, which is what I'm doing right now. 9 out of 10, great jump scares, and great design. Next, we have FNAF 5, or Sister Location. This game, compared to the others, has a lot more narrative. Each night, you are given different tasks, and you gotta survive through each one of them. And may I introduce the best part of the game? Please enter your name as seen above the keypad. This cannot be changed later. It seems that you had some trouble with the keypad. I see what you were trying to type, and I will auto-correct it for you. One moment. Welcome, Eggs Benedict. The first night is pretty much charity, but the following nights, oh, you're gonna die. For the animatronics, we have Funtime Freddy, Foxy, Ballerina, Circus Baby, and Ennard. These animatronics are more futuristic-like. Their jump scares are great, especially the ones where they reveal the insides of their face. I like that this game doesn't use the standard format of the other games, where you're just in a fixed location and you gotta survive by whatever means necessary. No, in this game, you are assigned to complete different objectives in different locations. And that's what made this game really unique. The game does have that format after you beat the main game and is considered its own custom night. You gotta rely on the audio for some scenarios in the game, other times it's just spamming your left mouse button or dragging your mouse intensely. 
that's pretty much all I can say about this game without bringing in the story, so 9 out of 10. Great narrative, jump scares, the rest. Finally, we have FNAF 6 or Pizzeria Simulator. On the outside, it looks like a FNAF spin-off game, but then this happened. Great. So I am an owner of a pizzeria and it is my responsibility to decorate stuff, hope that I don't get a lawsuit and attract customers. After the work is done, the work isn't done. So we're back in the standard FNAF gameplay, this time we gotta finish up our chores. You can upgrade stuff so that some things can be more efficient if you have enough money. On your left and right side there are vents, there are no ways to protect yourselves from animatronics. Just like FNAF 4, you will heavily rely on the audio. There's also this map on the screen where you can toggle audio on specific locations. You can also control the temperature of the room and the fans. Some of the chores that you gotta do make some noise so it can attract the animatronics. For the animatronics, we got Scrap Baby, Lefty, Molten Freddy, and Chip from Chip and Dale. Let me just sink this one in. Why does Springtrap look like he's from an animated zombie movie? Besides all that, you can also play mini games with the items that you bought. There are secrets that you can access by playing some of them. What makes me love this game is the ending. It's just so cool and epic. This game is the perfect end for the franchise. 10 out of 10, lots of great content, great design, jump scares and all. It's great. Oh, you exist. Five Nights at Freddy's Security Breach, the first game in the franchise to have this one massive map. I think it looks cool with all the 80s retro stuff, but it doesn't make anything scary. Just a note, I haven't bought this game so I didn't play it, but I have seen videos about this game so all of what I am about to say is all of what I can talk about on the outside. The overall design for each character makes this game feel like it's targeted towards younger audiences, when FNAF is known for being gruesome and dark. What about the gameplay? Well, now we can move around in a first person perspective. We can also enter Glamrock Freddy. Moving around depletes his battery and there are dozens of charging stations for Freddy that are scattered throughout the whole map. There are these robots that are either janitors or guards. If they catch sight of you, they'll alert the nearby animatronics trying to get you. For the animatronics, we have Glamrock Freddy, Chica, Roxanne Wolf, Montgomery Gator, the daycare attendant, DJ Music Man, and... Hi, please take this map. Take a map. Thank you, please enjoy. The jump scares aren't great, but they're not bad too. We also got a human night guard, nothing special, but she just has the funniest jump scare of any horror game. Also, she's trying to get you, but rarely do you ever see her. Just like Pizzeria Simulator, there are also a few mini games that you can play, and just like that game, there are easter eggs that you can access by playing some of them. I'm gonna let this rant in here. Why is Springtrap in the game? He died in the last game. Why is he here? Why do some of the endings have fully animated cutscenes but some of the endings are in a comic book format? Why did the game come out in such a buggy state? Why does this game exist? I know FNAF is one of those franchises that a lot of fans want to continue, especially for me, but the people who came up with this game need to respect the timeline and the entire story of the games. I'm gonna give this game a 7 out of 10. A bit scary, looks a bit challenging, the overall design of the map and the characters just doesn't fit well for a horror game. Now to the spin-offs, the first one, FNAF World. This is an RPG take on the franchise, containing characters from the first game to the FNAF 4, alongside some characters that never appeared in these games. You take control of Freddy and explore the world, just like any other turn-based RPG, enemies appear randomly. You can use up to 8 animatronics split into 2 groups of 4. You can unlock new animatronics by simply facing them. There are also bosses. That's it. You can buy upgrades and items that can help you. There are multiple areas, each correlating with a specific theme. 
Just like Pizzeria Simulator, there are a bunch of minigames included. There are a ton of easter eggs that you can access here and there within these. And while you think that this game is an RPG, there are still jump scares in here. It is a Five Nights at Freddy's game after all. 8 out of 10, a lot of content. Not a great RPG, but not a bad one. Lastly, we have Ultimate Custom Night. While I consider this game a spin-off, there are scenarios in the game that deals with the main story of the series. And some are just plain weird. As the title implies, this game is solely one giant custom night. You got all the animatronics from the first game to Pizzeria Simulator, and let me tell you, this is definitely one of the hardest games in the series. The hardest one yet. You have a lot more gameplay mechanics, which means you have a lot more responsibility. If you're gonna play this game for the first time, just start off with a low level of difficulty and a few number of animatronics. It's also gonna take a lot of time to figure out the controls, which are really vital since this game is really fast paced. 8 out of 10, sheer insanity, great jump scares, not much content but, you know. So that's the entirety of the FNAF franchise. I definitely missed the old days, back when fan music videos and short animated films were quite popular. Now I just kind of think that the franchise is slowly losing identity. Not because they keep making bad games back to back or they're not doing anything original, it's just because they don't have the same flair as they did back when they were starting out. It's nice to look back on this series, it's definitely one of my childhood classics. Might want to talk about that soon. Oh hey, I don't know if I can keep this up. The more I play difficult games, the less time I can spend being more happy. But I got nothing to do with my life besides playing video games, so I decide to be a moron. Not you again. Ninja Gaiden 2. Not that one, this one. The second installment in the Ninja Gaiden trilogy for the NES. Great. The game was first released in Japan on April 6, 1990, in North America on May 1990, and in Europe on October 27, 1994. The game is titled Ninja Gaiden 2 The Dark Sword of Chaos. In Europe, it is called Shadow Warriors 2 The Dark Sword of Chaos, and in Japan, it is called I Give Up. A monthly American video game magazine called Electronic Gaming Monthly previewed Ninja Gaiden 2 in late 1989 and early 1990. Nintendo initially introduced the game as an arcade game for their PlayChoice 10 system at Chicago's American Coin Machine Exposition in March 1990, which was marketed as a sequel to the first Ninja Gaiden arcade game. The game also had ports published for the Amiga and MS-DOS by GameTech in 1991. Well, here we go again, a sequel to a franchise that I have to play for the sake of my existence. Gotta stay close to your identity, people. So here's the plot. After the first game's events, Ashtar, the bad guy who controlled the bad guy from the last game, is informed of that bad guy's defeat. He plans to rule over Earth by opening the Gate of Darkness. Meanwhile, Ryu ran into a bunch of thugs and some sort of monster. An anonymous person met Ryu after the fight and he told Ryu to go to the Tower of Laja to save Irene, the girl we met in the last game. On the way to the tower, Ryu got ambushed by a goon, and the goon told a little bit about Ashtar. Ryu made his way to the top of the tower, found another bad guy, and found Irene, or so he thought. It appeared to be Ashtar in disguise and he shot Ryu using his sword. Johnny Cage appears and Ashtar disappears into the maze of darkness. He revealed that his name is Robert and he's with special intelligence. Robert talks about the Sword of Chaos, or Ashtar's sword, and he tells Ryu to go to the maze to find Ashtar and Irene. We run into Ashtar and he starts talking about evil taking over the world, something like that, and we somehow ended up at the North Pole. And let me just sh show you this. What an absolute masterpiece of a dialogue. Irene told Ryu that there is an altar somewhere and that he must destroy it, and Jesus, how is this on the NES? This looks sick. 
After fighting some familiar creatures, Ryu runs into Robert who appears to be injured. Robert tells Ryu that Irene got caught once again. I'm starting to see a pattern here. A bunch of enemies is coming so Robert tries to hold him off as much as he can. He dies and Ryu finds Irene only to find his old enemy still alive. J Jack. Jackie Chan. Jackie explains how the evil sword works and the gate of darkness shall open. Ryu defeats him once again. Jackie comes back and turns into... What? He defeats Jaggy and he's still alive. So with the power of Ryu's clan, the dragon sword, and save states, he finally defeats Jackie Chan. And then we get a face reveal of Ryu. I wear masks with a smile for hours at a time. Irene is still alive, everything becomes romantic, and they stare into the sunset. The end. Now, the gameplay is still pretty much the same compared to the first game. In the very first level, we are introduced to ninjas with osteoporosis, a bunch of master splinters, and ninjas that throw shurikens and pieces out. You also have these red orbs around the area. Hitting them gives you random power-ups, with the most notable one being the clone power-up. This is a really useful power-up throughout the game, so you can only have up to two clones with you. It's really vital to have a clone throughout the level. The first boss is not all too difficult, he just walks around and then he charges at you. If you're clinging to a wall, let go right before he charges to that side. In the next act, now we have Jason Voorhees running at you and the most annoying enemy in any game. Birds. Right after the train section, we are now on top of a mountain. How did that happen? The air keeps pushing us and it is infuriating. The air changes direction so without giving you any second of preparation, and because of that, the air will just push you off a cliff. Like, how is that even possible? I know we're on top of a mountain, but that does not explain how a ninja carrying a katana keeps getting pushed by a freaking wind. Another thing I want to point out is that on each side of any platform, you can climb up and down like a ladder. It's just not plain obvious, it looks like it's part of the background or something. I just realized this 10 minutes into the game. Moving on to the boss. This is creepy. The boss sends out a group of spiders. The spiders are the most irritating part of this fight. If you try to go up, the boss goes down. If you try to go down, the boss goes up. But the boss gives you a little amount of time for you to land a hit. On to the next level, I- OH MY GOD! You can't see where the platforms are, this is ridiculous! It's not as annoying as the wind thing at the last level, but here it's easier to fall off without knowing there's a gap there. I want to point out the second worst enemy of the game. These guys. They like to jump around you and roll around. They are so annoying. Right after that area, you enter the tower. We also have this new guy that throws fireballs horizontally. I like to mess with this guy a bit, though he packs a lot. You need to land a ton of hits to defeat him. Afterwards, it's on to the next boss fight. We are fighting some sort of robot and he throws projectiles at you. He flies around so you need to get a hit for the robot to land. I'd say this boss fight is easier than the last one. As long as you're careful. We're in hell now. We have these things that float around and shoot 4 projectiles. It's hard to see them when the background is fire. Like, what am I supposed to do here? Shortly after this part, we move on to- Oh my- God, this is torture. I don't know which is worse now, this, this, or this. But that's not all. The water becomes more annoying in the boss fight. You have this thing in the upper middle and sometimes its hands come out of either side. Whenever you get hit here, it's easy to get pushed by the water and it's hard to get back up. But this boss fight is actually pretty easy. You just need a good amount of health and patience. So you move on to this sort of dungeon area with spikes around. Uh, you have less room to move around these areas, and it's easy to lose a ton of health. And come on, what's next? Muddy water? Quicksand? These guys never run out of ideas to give you a migraine. Obviously, the platforms are slippery because it's all ice. There's not much to say here other than the spiders who shoot fire at you. That's it. The next boss is Ashtar. This fight can be pretty annoying, and it takes a while to finish. A bunch of fireballs come at Ashtar and release them in the exact same way. After that, he teleports. There's no indication of where Ashtar will appear next. And fight is tough, but I gotta admit, the stage and the music during this fight 
rocks. We're inside a cave in the next stage. Um, this stage can be a bit confusing with these destroyed buildings covering the screen. And now everything is red. On to the next boss fight, we gotta defeat two gargoyles. They jump and shoot gums at you, moving on. Next we have the most disorienting background in NES history. Now we're in whatever this place is. Then we gotta fight the bad guy from the last game. Um, not much has changed compared to the first game, but it is still INCREDIBLY annoying. What the hell is this? So we gotta avoid the poison dripping from the ceiling while avoiding harmful meatballs. This fight does feel intense if you're low on health, but the stage is something I want to talk about. There's just too much room to move around, and I know I would still complain about it if the area is a bit smaller, but still. The next phase is similar to that of the final boss in the first game. You gotta hit the head first while avoiding its attacks and there's barely any room here. After enough damage, it's time to strike the heart. Game over. Ninja Gaiden 2 is definitely a step up in terms of cutscenes, enemy variety, and overall gameplay. Now the question is, is this harder than the first game? Yes, but not a whole bunch. This game has a ton of gimmicks that will definitely mess you up. Now the cutscenes look way better. There's much more stuff going in the background and it looks awesome. The new abilities are so helpful in this game. While the new abilities are great, that doesn't mean the game gets any easier. This is a Ninja Gaiden game and this one rocks. So Ninja Gaiden 2 is great, but it's still difficult. And Christmas is right around the corner, so I hope I'm gonna have a great time this month. And this just came in the mail. Oh hey, Merry Christmas to one and all. For this special occasion, i like to share some of my childhood classics, the games that made me who I am today. So we're going to find out why I can't get a life. Video games, one of the greatest creations of mankind, a new way to play games while disassociating from family members, friends, and possible relationships. I didn't really know what video games were until my dad gave me the original iPad. I remember playing Angry Birds and a Kung Fu Panda game in this thing, but to this day it's still a debacle whether the games on your phone are considered real video games. So let's jump a few years later when my dad bought an Xbox 360. Most of my childhood video games originated from the 7th generation of gaming, mainly the Xbox 360. The 360 is THE console for most people, no offense. So let's see what are the games that I played with this bad boy. One game that I mostly remember is none other than LEGO Marvel Super Heroes. Even though I haven't played this game in a while, this is still my favorite game. I was a huge Marvel fanboy at the time and being able to play most of the well-known Marvel characters in a LEGO game is the dream. There are a ton of easter eggs in this game and there's so much stuff to do here. Challenges, side quests, even just the overworld. I usually hop into this game and just fly or swing around the world. And whenever I feel bored doing so, I would just replay the story missions with different characters. See, that's one of the main things I like about this game. You aren't required to play this specific character only in this specific mission. No, you can play as other characters with the same abilities in any story mission. There's a ton of replayability in this game and that's just one of the few reasons why this game is my favorite. Now speaking of LEGO games, I also played the classic LEGO Batman the video game. This is another childhood classic of mine and it's still a lot of fun to play. The different abilities are so fun to use and you can use them in these iconic missions. My favorite part of this game is the penguin boss fight, it's just so engaging and so fun. But my go-to game is still LEGO Marvel Super Heroes. While LEGO Batman offers a ton of great content, there's just more great content in LEGO Marvel Super Heroes. Both of these games still hold the same amount of nostalgia anyway. By the way, this game comes in as a double pack with the game Pure. It's an off-road racing game where you drive a quad bike and do stunts. It's another game I also played back then, but it was never really my thing. The game is fun no doubt, but I didn't really play a ton of it back then. 
Also, I found out that this game is published by Disney Interactive Studios. It's really weird seeing a Disney published game not having any reference to any Disney media in particular. Oh, and you can't forget Call of Duty. Yes, I'm still missing the original Modern Warfare, you angry? My go-to game in this trilogy is Modern Warfare 3. While some consider this game to be the worst in the trilogy, I didn't really care at all. Back then, I only played Call of Duty mainly for the campaign and the side modes, never the multiplayer. But since I mostly play COD for the campaign, does that mean I like MW3's campaign? No. It's not perfect, it's not great, but it's not bad either. But the campaign has some fun missions to play and that's why I keep coming back to this game. While the original Modern Warfare trilogy is great, you can't forget Black Ops. Call of Duty Black Ops 1 and 2 are some of my favorite games in the franchise. The story, the characters, and the gameplay, all of them still hold up to this day. But for me personally, Black Ops 2 is easily the best. You got the same characters from the first game and the addition of the new characters, all of them are well written and have a purpose in the story. You also got these side missions where you got to finish different tasks. Sure you can just skip them but they actually have a great deal with how the story changes. Of course you can't forget the multiplayer. The multiplayer has some of the most memorable maps in COD history and overall it is a lot of fun but rarely did I ever play online multiplayer. The same goes for any other 360 games with multiplayer, so what my brother and I did is that we just add in a bunch of bots, select the map, and maximize the number of slots that you can use to customize your loadouts. It was great, though it did get a bit repetitive and boring sometimes, but for the most part, it was still a lot of fun. Oh, and you also can't forget zombies. While the game only has a few maps for zombies, they're still quite memorable and fun. Now Advanced Warfare sucks, but this was the first COD game I aimed to get all of the achievements. At least the ones I could get by playing the campaign. I didn't really care about the story, but I was down for its futuristic setting. The robots, the weapons, the sound design, it's so satisfying. Of course you're not an Xbox guy if you don't have a Halo game. The first Halo game I ever played was Halo Reach. The last game Bungie put out for the series that takes place before the first game, Halo Combat Evolved. I have a lot of great memories playing this game, mainly the campaign, firefight, and forge. You haven't played multiplayer? Yeah, I haven't played it because the Xbox One was nearly a year old and I couldn't find a single lobby and gave up. But that all changed when I finally bought the Master Chief Collection. Now I can play the multiplayer of Reach and the other Halo games. Back then, most of my memories playing this game was me and my brother playing the campaign in co-op. Uh, we would just mess around with each other and get a taste of what suffering is like by playing the campaign in Legendary. Another 360 exclusive title I played was Forza Horizon. Guys that own the Kinect, happy? Of course, you don't fully own a Kinect when you don't have its pack in game, Kinect Adventures. This game demonstrates the power of the Kinect which tracks your body movement using its motion sensors and camera. Now, is this game easy to control? No. Is there much to do in this game? No. Is this game fun? That depends on what you view as fun, but for me, no. Another title that demonstrates the power of the Kinect is Kinect Sports, which is basically a direct response to Wii Sports with the Wii. This should have been the pack and game for the Kinect instead of Kinect Adventures. This game is way more engaging and way more fun that it involves you trying to be more active within the game. And the overall content this game has compared to Kinect Adventures is much better. The controls work really well, especially with boxing and track and field. 
Another Kinect title I played was Kinect Rush, a Disney Pixar adventure game. This game is my favorite Kinect title, but it's far from perfect. Just like any other Kinect title, the controls aren't the best, but they're okay enough in this game. You can customize your own character and you can play in various scenes of other Disney Pixar movies along with the characters that belong to those movies. It's really fun to play with some of the most iconic Disney Pixar characters of all time. But like I said, the controls are what keep me away from this game and the only reason I want to come back to this game is for childhood pleasure. What is this? Dance Central 2, another game I played back then and had loads of fun with it. My family and I would play this game for hours, just dancing to some popular songs, especially the Numa Numa song. It's still amazing to see that this series is still alive with the 2019 release. So the 2019 release isn't compatible with the Kinect anymore, as it was released exclusively on the Oculus Quest, a VR system. I would definitely like to see a return for the Kinect. While yes, the Kinect is what killed the Xbox 360 in its late years and the Xbox One in its early years, I would still like to see the Kinect return to some form. Now that is pretty much the vast majority of games I remember playing on the 360 back then. So let's move on to another platform, the PSP. This PSP was handed down to me by my uncle. It had a ton of great games included, and by that, I don't mean those games. To start off, Iron Man. The controls aren't great, but the graphics looked so good at the time. I never finished this game because I always got confused with the controls. So what about a game that has great controls? Here is Star Wars Battlefront Renegade Squadron. When I first played this game, I was amazed by the graphics and all. It's so fun to play as some of the most memorable Star Wars characters of all time. The maps are huge and there are tons of ways to advance against your enemies. I would dominate my enemies, and by that, I mean bots. Yeah, I never really figured out how to play online with the PSP, but I didn't really bother with it. Speaking of Star Wars, I also played Star Wars The Force Unleashed. The controls on this game are amazing and it really works well with the PSP. This game is a lot of fun and the story is really engaging. Sure, there are some flaws in the story of these games, but you gotta admit, they have better writing than... Somehow Palpatine returned. I remember putting in cheat codes in this game so that I could play as Obi-Wan, Anakin, Luke, and any other character within the Star Wars universe, even though they don't have anything to do with the main story of the game. There are these side quests where you can play as specific characters within some of the most iconic battle scenes in Star Wars history. This game is amazing. But there is one other game that is memorable for me. Persona 3 Portable. This is the game for the PSP. This game takes about 65 and a half hours to complete. There's just a ton of stuff to do here. And the main gameplay is astonishing. This is the first turn-based RPG I've ever played and it really changed my perspective on pretty much every variety of role-playing games. The story is amazing. The choices you make have a really great impact on how the story turns out. The dungeons are well designed, there's a lot of enemy variety. The game can be a bit hard at times, but back then the difficulty was okay for me. So that's pretty much all the childhood video games that I could think of. Another huge portion of my video game childhood originated from the iPad, and if mobile games are considered to be real video games, then might as well include them here. Temple Run, Jetpack Joyride, Fruit Ninja, Flappy Bird, Geometry Dash, Plants vs Zombies, Tiny Tower, and of course, Minecraft. These games, while simple, holds a ton of value to me, and the types of games that we played back when we were kids made us who we are today. So if you're reminiscing about the good old days, if you still have those games lurking around in your basement, go ahead and play them. There's no harm being a child at heart. So I wish you all a Merry Christmas and see you all next year.